Hey, it's Noel from creationeffects.com and this is the tutorial for using Landscaper. Landscaper is an Adobe After Effects template that lets you create awesome 3D landscape animations. This has been many months in the making and I'm very excited to finally show it to you. Uh, I've actually had this idea for years but was always too scared to do it because it just seemed so daunting. Uh, well, as I worked on it, it evolved into something much bigger and more daunting but also much better. Uh, than anything I envisioned. So there's lots to go over, uh, but let's just start with the basics. Landscaper comes with 1,000 landscape elements to build your scene with. So rocks, grass, bushes, trees, hills, cliffs, mountains, everything you need to make just about any type of landscape, uh, including deserts, jungles, caves, beaches, forests, mountains, gardens, savannas, swamps, oceans, alien worlds, fantasy landscapes, you name it. If you want to add 3D water to your scene, all you have to do is draw a mask in the shape of your water and it appears. Then you can choose from dozens of custom effects to enhance your scene so you can make elements blow in the wind or add fog or 3D titles, waterfalls, heat haze, shooting stars. Basically anything you saw in the demo video is included in the template plus a whole lot more and you can customize the effects to suit your scene. One of the coolest features of the template is what I called Auto Sky. So what it does is you switch it on and then you can adjust the clock control to set the time of day. So you can set it to about 7 p.m. and you'll see your landscape with a sunset and all the elements will darken and have an orange tint. Or you can set it to the middle of the night and everything gets dark and bluish and the moon and stars come out. And what's really cool is if you keyframe the clock control, you create a time-lapse effect. And all the clouds, the sun, moon, fog, water, plants blowing in the wind, everything speeds up according to how fast the clock is turning. Now, if you don't have time to make your own landscape, I've got you covered. I've included the 30 landscapes that I made for the demo video. So you can drop in a 3D title and render those out or customize them to make something unique. And uh, that brings me to another important feature, customization. Every landscape has a control layer with lots of slider controls for customizing your scene. So the ground, water, sky, sun, moon, atmospheric haze, scene lighting, all of that can be customized from the control layer. And the optional effects. With, with the exception of a few pre-rendered elements, uh, those can also be customized using slider controls. Everything's designed to make it easy for you, the landscaper. There are written instructions throughout the template, but this video will be your main instruction for using the template, and there is a lot to go over, but I promise not to waste your time. Everything I talk about will be relevant and helpful, uh, except for when it's not, like the stuff I'm saying right now. But my plan here is to run through the entire template really fast the first time, and just give you a sense of what you're going to do, and then I'm gonna go through it in detail and explain how everything works. And I'll end by showing you some helpful tips for creating better landscapes. I'm planning on doing a different tutorial that focuses just on the custom effects from the effects folder, uh, since those are optional. And I would also like to do another tutorial sometime soon where I just make an entirely new landscape showing the process from beginning to end. So you can look for that as well. So let's get started. Uh, after your purchase, you'll be emailed a download link and it's a big file because of all the images and video clips, about one and a half gigabytes. If you uh, have any problems downloading it, just send me a message on the about page of creationeffects.com. And once you've downloaded the zip file, if you're on Windows, you'll want to right click it and choose the extract all option. Opening it that way will lower the risk of you getting errors uh, when you open the project in After Effects. Or if you're on a Mac, you can just double click it to open it and uh, that will create a new folder. So just open that folder and you'll find the Landscaper AEP file in there and open that in After Effects. And because it's a big project, it will take a minute to open up. And when it does, uh, you'll see some instructions for getting started here. You should have your project panel here and your effect controls panel. If you don't see the effect controls, just go to window and effect controls. And then we'll make this panel nice and big so we can read all the controls. 
Back in the project panel, we've got this folder with uh, the finished landscapes, and uh, we'll just take a quick peek in there. These are the 30 landscape animations that you saw in the demo video or in the intro in this video. There's uh, an HD version and a 4K version for each one. If you need a different resolution, I'll go over how to do that later. But uh, unless you really need 4K, I recommend you use the HD versions just because they're going to be faster to work with and to render. Now, if you're not going to use these landscapes, uh, you're welcome to just delete the whole folder. Uh, I mean, make sure you've, you have a backup copy of the original somewhere. But you could delete the landscapes you don't need and it will bring the project file size down from about 170 megabytes to 50 megabytes. Which, I don't know, that might make it run smoother. Uh, but if you do want to keep them there, they can actually be a great resource if you want to learn new techniques or see how I created a certain effect. Each landscape has this notes layer at the top that talks about what's unique in that landscape and how I did it. All right, I think that's all I'm going to say about the finished landscapes in this video. Uh, once you understand how to build your own landscape, then you'll understand these. So let's just run through this build your own landscape folder really quick. Uh, the first thing you'll probably want to do is choose your ground and sky images, which you can do in these three pre-comps, ground, sky, and stars. All you'll do is unhide any image you want in these comps, and uh, then you'll open your landscape comp. And it will have your empty landscape uh, using the images that you chose. Almost every comp in the template will have an instructions layer at the top, so be sure to read those. In addition, every layer has instructions or helpful information in the comment column. So if you want to learn more about a layer, just make this really big and expand the layer to read that. Next we have the control layer. Just select the layer and look in your effect controls panel. This is how you customize all the essential elements of the scene like the ground, haze, water, sun, and auto sky. And then we have your camera layer. You'll want to animate this after you've built your scene. And you'll have to keep it subtle as you'll see uh, you're limited in how far you can move the camera if you're using the ground plane. You can see if I reveal the camera's keyframes uh, by selecting the layer and hitting the U key, there are already some keyframes on the position and point of interest to make the camera move forward. And then we have the sun layer. Uh, we actually have a few sun layers and they all do something different. You can see this layer and the other sun layers are yellow along with the moon layer, the stars, and sky image. So everything in the sky is yellow. Next we have three green layers, and these are the layers that create the ground plane. I used a technique called camera projection mapping to create the 3D ground plane, and I'll explain how all that works later in the video. As you'll see in a moment, all of the elements that you'll add to the scene are green layers as well, so everything on the ground is green. And then we have three blue layers, which as you might expect are the water layers. The water layers are under the ground layers, so if we hide our ground plane, which is this layer, ground projection screen, uh, we have an instant ocean, which reflects the clouds and whatever background elements you might have here, like mountains. Now this water doesn't really look like ocean water, but you can easily darken it and tint it using the water controls on the control layer. If you want to have land and water, you can take your pen tool, draw a lake on your ground layer, and invert the mask, and you have a lake. And notice how the edges of the water are darker, like wet mud, and also the edge of the water is randomly shifting and changing shape, like waves. All of that can be customized on the control layer. The rest of the layers are your sun and moon and sky stuff. Uh, you can position the sun and moon manually using the control layer, or you can turn on auto sky in here, and uh, as you adjust your clock, the sun and moon and lighting is all automatic. But you can still adjust the colors and positions, as I'll show you later. Now, chances are you're going to want to fill up your landscape with elements, uh, because this is boring and barren. So let's go to the Element Library folder. The JPEG files are in these folders, uh, organized into categories. But you can ignore these folders and just open the Element Library comp. Uh, the elements are organized by category in here as well, and in alphabetical order. 
You just unhide a layer to see what it is. Um, you can search by keyword in the search field, or you can search the element library online as well, uh, which is what I recommend, and I'll show you that later. But when you find an element you want, you just copy it and paste it into your landscape. Uh, if it's a background element like these mountains, place it right below the water layers. Now I'll go back and find a middle ground element, like this tree. I'll copy that. And since this is a middle ground element, it goes above our water layers. You can see how the anchor point is right at the base of the tree and it's automatically positioned to sit right on the ground plane. And we can use the, the 3D gimbal to position the tree wherever we want on the ground plane or scale it if we need to, or we can move it down into the ground if we want, or rotate it. Once you fill up your landscape with elements, you're probably going to want to add some effects to give your scene some motion and bring it to life. Uh, I'll close the element library folder and open the effects folder. And I'll open one of these. So there's a separate comp for each effect, and at the top of each comp there's an instructions layer that tells you everything you need to know, how it's made, tips for using it, and uh, application instructions for getting the effect into your landscape. Usually you just copy and paste a couple of things, and uh, then there are usually some customization controls for adjusting the look of the effect. So the written instructions should be enough uh, for using the effects, but I know that sometimes it helps to actually see it done. So like I said, I'm going to make a different tutorial that shows how you apply and customize each effect. Um, but I did want to briefly show you what each effect does right now, just so you know what your, your options are. So I'll go in order. Uh, first we have 3D Warp. This one warps your 2D elements as your camera moves in a way that makes them look 3D. You'll definitely want to watch the tutorial for that one. Uh, next we have Aurora's. Uh, this is just a pre-rendered clip, so no customization controls. You just composite it over your sky. Uh, it's made with the Aurora template from Creation Effects, which allows you to make custom Auroras if you're interested in that. Next, the beach effect is cool. It's a, a number of ocean surf clips shot from overhead, looking down. Um, these are composited over your shorelines to create beach scenes. The cast shadows effect is a way to get elements to cast shadows onto the ground plane. Unfortunately, you can't just turn on the cast shadows option for 3D layers like you normally would uh, because of how the comp is set up. It won't work. But this effect can do it if you need it. Um, the clouds effect has a number of cloud options, all made in After Effects so you can customize them. You can just use one of the cloud photos as your sky, but if you want to do a time lapse, you should use this effect because they'll speed up with the clock. The crop below water effect lets you move elements down into your water because you can move elements right through the ground plane, but you can't move them through the water and that's by design. Sometimes it's a good thing, but sometimes it's a bad thing. So uh, this is an easy copy and paste effect that'll let you do that. The Falling Leaves comps has a couple pre-rendered clips that you can use. If you want to make your own leaf animations, you can check out the Falling Leaves template from Creation Effects. The Phlox template has some pre-rendered flocks of birds made with the Phlox template, which is one of the most popular templates from Creation Effects. The Fog effect is probably the most important one in here. I used it in almost every landscape because it helps tie all the different elements together. And there's a few different options here to get different looks. The atmospheric haze effect tints elements according to their distance from the camera to uh, make them look further away. This one's important and it's already built into your scene and all the elements. Um, it's just here in case you want to add haze to your own elements that you add. Heat haze warps and blurs areas of your scene to simulate intense heat, uh, good for desert scenes or hot rocks. The lightning effect lets you easily and randomly brighten areas of a cloudy sky to simulate lightning in the distance. The moon shadow effect fills in the dark side of your crescent moon, so by default that area of the moon is empty, so you can see stars through it. But this fills it in and adds a glow around the moon that blows out the stars, so it's a little more realistic. 
Pollen uses the CC particle world effect to create floating dust particles or pollen. Uh, this could be good for just about any scene. The rainbow effect lets you make custom rainbows. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the reflections effect is important uh, because only background elements are reflected in your water by default. If you have trees or hills or any element on your ground plane, uh, you'll need to add this effect to reflect them in the water. Scene lightness is a lot like atmospheric haze in that it tints elements according to its distance from the camera, but this affects the brightness of elements rather than the color or hue. Um, the shooting star comp has a cartoony shooting star as well as a more realistic one, and it has a larger, slower asteroid, all customizable. The snow effect lets you add quick and easy snow to your scene. The sun rays effect has two options. You can add light rays from somewhere off frame, or you can add rays which radiate outward from your sun. Uh, the radiating rays are actually already built into the sun by default, but this can be used for, for brighter rays. Uh, the swarms comp has some pre-rendered insect clips, so I included some butterflies flying across the frame and a swarm of mosquitoes and fireflies. The swarms template is part of the same popular series as Phlox that I talked about earlier, so you can create custom swarms of a variety of insects with that. In the title effects, um, I brought in about 20 titles from the creation title effects template which has 200 custom titles, if that interests you. Uh, the titles that I included here are mostly nature-themed, and um, you can easily edit the text and the font. And one modification I made to these, which I really like, is you can just duplicate any of these titles a bunch of times, and it will create a 3D extrusion and make them 3D. The waterfalls effect has four different waterfalls, ranging from short to very tall. Um, you can customize them with slider controls. And lastly, we have wind, uh, which you can copy and paste to plant or grass elements, and it will make them sway or quiver in the wind. So there you go, lots of options, as you can see. Um, I won't talk about these anymore. Just go to the Landscaper webpage to access the tutorial on the effects. All right, that was the overview. I think we're ready to dive a bit deeper now. That might be enough information for you to get started, um, but this is really one of those tools where the better you understand it, the better your landscapes will be. So I'd encourage you to keep watching because you're gonna learn a lot. I'm going to go back to the beginning, step one, uh, choosing a ground image. There are 68 ground images to choose from, and all you do is unhide the one you want. There's some aerial images at the top here. Um, you can make aerial animations, no problem, but most of the elements are photos that were taken at eye level, so they wouldn't fit in an aerial landscape too well. There are dirt grounds here, uh, forest floors, ice, grass, sand, snow, all kinds of grounds. And for the most part, they're all featureless uh, because you're going to be adding elements to them. And of course, you can use your own image in here uh, just scale it to make it fill this comp uh, with the horizon line at the top of the comp. I'm just going to choose one of these dirt images. I'll use that one. Uh, next, I'll open the sky pre-comp. Just a couple of things to note. This uh, top layer will give you a clear sky, and you can select the colors you want. Uh, you'll want to use a clear sky if you're going to be using the clouds effect for a time lapse. Otherwise, you can just choose any of these cloud photos or bring in your own. And I should also clarify, you don't need to use one of these sunset images if you want a sunset scene. You can use any image and the colors of the sky will change to look like a sunset. All right, in the stars pre-comp, you've got some full-blown Milky Way images or just a few stars or some nebulas if you want something more surreal. I'll open my HD landscape now, and you can see the image is updated. Um, before I get into the control layer, I wanna add some elements and talk about the element library some more. There are 1,000 elements, um, but you can see if I select this folder, we have over 1,600 images in here. And that's because there are over 600 displacement map images in here. 
These are for the 3D warp effect, which, if you remember, allow you to make the elements look three-dimensional. Anyway, as I mentioned, you can ignore these folders. Um, you shouldn't ever drag images from here into your landscape. Any element that you want in your landscape must be copied and pasted from the element library comp. So first, a little information on these images. Um, all of the original photos are public domain. About 98% of them were taken from pixabay.com, which is an awesome website, and I couldn't have made the template without them. I plan on uploading a significant portion of these transparent background images that I made to uh, the Pixabay website um, to give something back to that community because I've really taken a lot over the years. Um, you can go to their site if you want to look at their license, but basically you're free to use them in commercial or non-commercial projects, no attribution required. I also got a few images from Wikimedia Commons and Flickr Creative Commons, again only public domain images. After downloading the photos, I took them into Photoshop and I spent months cutting out the elements in great detail and I'm talking tracing individual blades of grasses in many cases so that I could give you a clean, isolated image with no fringing and no aliasing. Um, I used a lot of different methods to select the elements, uh, but after doing this hundreds of times, I found that the cleanest selection comes from uh, tracing the edges manually using my stylus and just the standard lasso selection tool. I kept the elements at their original resolution, no downsizing, so that you would have the most pixels to work with. Um, I also did my best to choose photos that were taken during midday while the sun was high uh, to keep the lighting and colors as consistent as possible. And once I cut them out, I added a solid color background to them and saved them as JPEG files. Now, why didn't I just save them as PNGs with transparent backgrounds, you ask? Well, thanks for asking. It's because, uh, one, PNGs have a much bigger file size, and two, I actually ran some tests and found that After Effects processed the JPEGs faster than the PNGs, even when it had to key out the green background from the image. So anyway, all the elements have a key light effect, which really does a perfect job of keying out the background. All right, in our element library comp, uh, the elements are organized by category in alphabetical order. Uh, so you can see here we have cliffs and canyons. If you scroll down to the next yellow layer, we have the next category, flowers. And notice that each element has been tagged with keywords in the comment column. So one way to search for elements is by typing your keywords into the search field. First, make sure that no layers are selected or it won't work. So to make sure, I usually do Shift-Command-D to deselect all layers, and then type your keyword. If I unhide the instructions layer at the top, it gives you some tips for searching. So you can search by type of landscape or by climate or uh, descriptive adjectives. And if you want to search uh, for more than one keyword, leave out the commas and it will show you the elements that match all of your keywords. If you have commas in between the keywords, it will show you all the matches, even if they only use one of the keywords you entered. So this way of searching is fine. Uh, it's convenient because you can do it right inside of After Effects. But I created another way that I think is more efficient. Um, if you copy and paste the URL in the instructions layer here, it will take you to the element library online. And you can also find the link to the library in the, the readme file that came in your download or on the Landscaper webpage. Um, the online library is nice because, first of all, the images are all visible. You don't have to unhide each one to preview it. Second, they're divided into categories again, uh, but they're in order of similarity rather than alphabetical. So as you're scrolling through the cliffs and they start to look more like what you're looking for, you know you're getting close. And since many of these elements actually fit into more than one category, um, a lot of the images are listed more than once. So inside this cliffs and canyons category, you might find some images from the mountains category or from the rocks and formations category because they're similar. And then you can see in this column which category that element is actually found in in After Effects. 
And lastly, I included the keywords here as well. So uh, you could use your, your browser's search filter if you want to find it that way. Um, the shortcut for the search should be Command F or Control F. Um, but I would only do that if you have something really specific you're looking for. If you just type in grass or something, it's going to show you hundreds of images. All right, so once you find the element you want here, then you can come back to After Effects and you can search for the element's name and here, or just scroll down to the right category and find the right layer. Now, as I said before, you have to copy and paste the element from this comp and not drag it from the project panel. The reason is these layers have the key light effect and color correction effects and specific material option settings and specific anchor point and position settings. So it's all ready to work in your landscape. Uh, just copy it, go to your landscape and paste it. Now again, where you place the layer depends on whether it's a background element or not. Most elements, uh, the foreground and middle ground elements, should be placed right above the blue water layers. Any element can be a foreground or a background element. It's really just about where you're positioning it. So in this template, uh, foreground elements refer to any element where the base is too close to be seen. So somewhere down here. Middle ground elements are any element where the base is somewhere on the ground plane. And background elements are behind the ground plane, which if we look at the position of the ground plane, that's 25,000 pixels back on the z-axis. So when you put something in the background like mountains, that element should go directly underneath the water layers. Um, the difference is when you put elements under the water layers, they're automatically reflected in the water. And it would be great if we could just do that with all elements, but uh, you can see if we move the tree down here, it disappears behind the ground layer. So middle ground elements should be up here. And uh, if it needs to be reflected in water, uh, you'll just add a reflections effect from the effects folder. Whether you put elements above or below the water layers, uh, just make sure all the elements above the water layers stay together and all the elements below the water layers are all together uh, without adding any 2D layers in between them because that can disrupt the order uh, in which After Effects renders the layers. I'm going to fill up my scene a little more by adding more elements. Um, I'll probably fast forward most of this just for time's sake. But uh, the first thing that I notice here is that there's this little gap underneath my mountains. Sometimes you'll see that in background elements and all you got to do is just move it down a little bit. Uh, another thing I see here is that the lighting angle doesn't match. So with these mountains, you can see the sun is shining from the left side and with the tree, it's shining on the right side. So what I can do is just flip my tree. I'll unlink the scale and then make this negative 170. And what I usually like to do is create a frame for my landscape by building up the edges with elements. So I might put some mountains or something on the sides. So let me go look for those. All right, so it's not perfect, but it gives us a little bit more to work with here. Something I like to do, uh, but you don't have to, and I did this in all of the finished landscapes, I would arrange the element layers in order of distance. So the closest element is at the top and the furthest at the bottom. Uh, it just makes it easier to find your elements, especially when you get 20 or more in here. Okay, I'm gonna go through the control layer uh, because there's stuff to talk about in here. And I'm going to spend a while in here because as I move through each section, I'll explain how that part of the landscape is set up and how it works. So let's start at the top with the scene controls. We have some checkboxes here that disable some of the effects in your scene. 
Uh, I didn't use these much myself, but my thinking was, uh, for example, as you start adding the wind effect to like 30 different plants, the comp is going to get really slow. So you could check this box and After Effects would run faster. And when you're ready to render, you turn it back on. Also, we have some camera controls. If you're more comfortable just adjusting the properties on the camera layer itself, that's fine too. Um, if you keyframe this camera field of view, you can get the JAWS effect. Uh, depth of field can make a scene look really nice. Um, you can have a blurry background or foreground. And while we're on the scene controls, I think it's a good time to talk about changing the resolution. Uh, there's a few steps to doing that. You have the HD and 4K comps to choose from, uh, but if you need a different resolution, just open the one that's closest to what you want. So let's say I want my scene to be 8K. Um, I'd open the 4K option and then open the composition settings. You can do that by going to composition and then composition settings or typing the shortcut, which is command K on a Mac or control K on a PC. And then you can enter your resolution or choose one of the presets. I'll choose 8K down here. And you can see we've exposed the edges of our scene. So to fix that, we'll zoom in. I'll open the, uh, the camera options and adjust the zoom proportionally. So if you doubled the resolution, you would double the zoom amount. I did a little less than double, so I'll set this to around 2,900. And we're not done yet. Some things don't look right. Um, I'll go here and click where it says layer name and change it so it says source name. So that now we see the names of the source layers. And all the ones that say 4K on them, uh, we need to change their resolution to match this comps resolution. Most of these are solid layers, you can tell, uh, because of this little icon right next to the name, which is a, a colored square. We'll select the ones that say 4K and go to Layer and Solid Settings and click Make Comp Size. And if you want, you can rename this to 8K and then click New. So be sure to do this with all the solid layers that are named 4K. Um, there is one layer down here, the water texture, and this one's not a solid layer, it's a pre-comp. I'll double click that one to open it, and then change the comp resolution to 8K. And that should do it. Uh, just keep in mind, there's just this one water texture pre-comp for the entire template. So if you change its resolution, it's going to affect your other landscapes as well. Uh, you may need to start a new project or something. Moving on, uh, let's cover the ground controls. I need to explain how the ground is made or you'll never be able to customize it beyond what these controls do. So I used a technique called camera mapping or projection mapping or camera projection or camera projection mapping. No one can agree on what it's called, which I found kind of hilarious. But whatever you call it, it's used even in big budget films to create a 3D landscape from a 2D image or a matte painting. It does this by projecting the 2D image onto a 3D surface. So I made this little diagram to illustrate. Um, you can see we have three different elements in here. Uh, we've got a light source and we have a 2D image represented by this little film strip. And then we have a projection screen uh, which can take the shape of any 3D form. And this template, I've kept things really simple and the projection screen is just a flat surface uh, that's rotated to lay horizontally. So this setup is basically like a movie theater. The light source um, would be the light bulb in a movie projector. And it's projecting light through the film strip, projecting that image onto a screen. Uh, the big difference being that our projector screen is lying down, which will let us move our camera over it and our projected image will look 3D. All right, back in our landscape comp, I'm gonna to switch to the right view. So we're looking at the scene from the right side and we have our spotlight here. It's pointed straight ahead uh, this way. And that might be hard to tell uh, because the cone angle is so big. It's at 150 degrees. 
if I lower that, um, that looks more like a spotlight. But you don't want to lower it because it will reduce the projection area. Um, anyway, also note that our camera is at the exact same position as the spotlight layer. They're both the same height and 800 pixels in front of the scene center. Um, you can move the camera, but don't move the light layer. And that's why I have it locked. And uh, right in front of the light layer is our film strip, um, our projected ground image layer. If I double click it, it opens up our ground pre-comp where we chose our ground image. So that's what this is. If I zoom in, uh, you can see it's really small and it's sitting right in front of our light layer and move down a little bit so that the top of the layer lines up with the middle of the camera view, um, which is why our horizon line is near the middle of the scene. You can see if I reveal the layer scale and position, uh, we're using very small numbers here, decimal numbers. Um, so don't even bother with these values. Uh, just use the controls on the control layer, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Now, if we zoom way out, uh, we can see the projection screen, our actual ground plane. Um, it comes all the way out to here. And then this is our sky and our star layer back here. All right, I'll go back to active camera view. Um, you can see what that did when I decreased the cone angle on our light layer. I'll set that back to 150. So here's the big limitation in camera mapping. I'll hit the C key to bring up my camera dolly tool. And if I move the camera forward, it looks really cool uh, until I go too far. And then the ground starts to look distorted. And same thing if you move the camera backward or sideways. So you're limited in how far you can move the camera. In fact, the only camera position in which the ground is not warped at all is its default position which is the same position as the spotlight layer. Um, to get back to that default position, all you need to do is open the camera and hit this reset button. Now, to get the most possible movement out of your camera with the least amount of ground distortion, let's say you wanted your camera to move forward, then you would start your movement by moving your camera back as far as you can. And I'll show you how to extend these ground edges uh, so you can move the camera back even further. And then your camera will pass over its default position and go as far as you want forward. And the ground warping will be split on either side of that default position, if that makes sense. So can you make really crazy camera movements like have it fly in and, and go a long distance or start with a camera pointing some other direction and then moving over here? Uh, yeah, you certainly can, but not with this ground layer. You'd have to put in your own ground layer or hide the ground or um, just fill up that space with grass elements or something like that. Uh, let me show you something else. Um, a few of the images in the ground pre-comp aren't complete or they don't go all the way to the horizon line. You can use one of these images or even use some other element from the element library as your ground. And uh, then in your landscape comp, what you'll do is select your ground plane the ground projection screen layer, zoom in, make sure the preview resolution is set to full, and then use your pen tool to draw a mask around the ground. And then you'll be able to see the water below or whatever elements you put back here. All right, I'm getting sick of talking about the ground. So I'm just gonna run through these controls real quick. Um, you'll notice that these controls have some instructions in here, as do all these other controls. Uh, so that could be helpful. Um, I'll move the camera back on the z-axis so that we start to see the edge of the ground. You have a few options. You can adjust your camera movement so that it never exposes the edges, or you can scale your ground up using the ground scale controls, or you can extend the edges by tiling or mirroring the image using this extend ground edges control. For most ground images, it won't be noticeable that it's being tiled, especially if you have a bunch of elements in the foreground obscuring the ground. And also, then you don't lose any detail in the ground by stretching or scaling it. Next, we have blend ground and background. Uh, this is how we get atmospheric haze on the ground plane. 
And it's also how we make it look like the ground and background elements all, are all part of the same landscape. Most of the time, when you add your background elements, you'll see a sharp line where the ground meets the background elements because the colors don't match. Um, this will let you blend them together. So if there's no background elements, you can usually just sample the sky color. Uh, if you have mountains or something, you can sample the color of the mountains. This is just a, a beam effect um, that goes along the horizon line. So you can adjust the width and opacity here. And you really should make sure the background elements are the color you want them to be first before you sample their color. So that means figure out your haze control settings. So let's look at those. The haze, or atmospheric haze, is made with a tint effect on every element. In the haze controls, the haze color is the color that your elements will be tinted uh, more and more the further they are from the camera. So this can often be the same color as your blend color, or sometimes it can be the color of your sky or clouds near your horizon. Or if it's a sunset, it can be a dark color to make your background more of a silhouette. Um, you see we have a minimum tint percentage and a maximum tint percentage. Uh, the minimum is how much an element is tinted if it's sitting like right next to the camera, so at the camera's position. Uh, in other words, all the elements will be tinted at least to this amount, um, which helps unify all the different elements, which come from different photos and different lighting. Uh, the max tint percentage is how much elements will be tinted at this distance from the camera, the visibility amount, which is set to 25,000 pixels. Uh, if you remember, the ground plane, whose anchor point is way back on the far side, is positioned at 25,000 pixels uh, from the center of the scene. So normally you would put your furthest background element, like mountains, uh, behind or at the far edge of your ground plane, at 25,000 pixels. Um, you can move it further back than that if you want, uh, like I'll do 35,000 pixels and then scale it up. But if you do that, you'll just need to move it down a little bit on the y-axis because you can see uh, the gap at the end of the ground plane. Um, also, keep in mind that the sky and stars are about 30,000 pixels back in z-space. Uh, moving your mountains back further than that isn't going to make them disappear behind the sky um, because we have some 2D layers between the mountains and the sky which kind of breaks our 3D scene um, or it upsets some of the, the rules of 3D space. That's just how After Effects made it. But uh, just to make sure the perspective is right as your camera moves, it's probably better to have the sky further back than your background elements. And you can push the sky and stars images back if you want to, and uh, then scale them up. You're not going to break anything by doing that. Um, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to haze. So usually you set the visibility to about where your furthest element is positioned. And then set the amount that you want that element to be tinted with the max tint percentage control. Just one more note on that uh, to make things more confusing for you. If you look at the camera position, it's at negative 800 pixels by default. So that's 800 pixels in front of the center of the scene. So technically this should be 25,800 um, because you should take the camera position into account. Next up is density distribution. Uh, if you bring this below 50%, you move more haze to the elements closer to the camera. Or if you go above 50%, the balance of haze shifts toward the back of the scene. At 50%, the haze is evenly distributed. And last of all, we have separate controls for tinting the ground plane and the sky if you want to do that. Next, let's talk about water. I already briefly showed you how to make water by drawing it with the pen tool on the ground projection screen layer. Uh, check the inverted checkbox to invert the mask. Or if you have multiple bodies of water, this checkbox won't work. You'll, you'll need to set the mask from Add to Subtract. Notice how the curves are more detailed in the distance. Um, and if you're worried about getting the perspective right, you can always set the camera view to Top View, and then zoom way out. And now we're looking at the ground plane 
from the top. So we're looking down and you can just draw your lake without the perspective um, and then go back to active camera view and you can adjust the shape as needed. The water controls here are divided into sections, uh, reflections, texture, and the edge. So let's look at our blue water layers for a moment. I'll solo our background element and I'll unhide this bottom water layer named water reflection. This is just a 2D adjustment layer and it creates a mirror image of whatever layers are under it, reflecting them from the horizon line. The next layer, water reflection adjustments, um, it adds displacement, so like ripples. It uses a displacement map effect to make the ripples and the displacement map effect is looking at the layer above it to determine which pixels to displace. So let's look at that layer named water texture. In addition to acting as a displacement map to displace or warp your reflection, this texture is also overlaid on top of your reflection to make some parts of the water darker and some parts lighter. And you can customize the opacity and all that on the control layer. You can see this is a pre-comp layer, um, but if we open it up by double clicking, we can't see anything. Uh, there is a 3D layer in here with a turbulent noise effect which creates the texture and this layer is the same resolution as your ground plane but we can't see it because all of its properties are controlled by master properties. We're not going to get into that but if even if you could see the texture and you edited it in here it wouldn't make a difference. It would still look just like this in your landscape. If you open the essential properties on this layer here are all the properties that determine how this layer looks. And all of these properties are linked to the properties of your ground plane. So your water always sticks with your ground plane. Um, if you really need to, you can disable the expression of one of these properties and then adjust it manually. Um, but I don't really recommend it. Let's go over the water controls now. Uh, the water reflection section, I actually don't think I need to talk about these because they're pretty self-explanatory. You can adjust the amount of displacement here as well as the color and brightness of the water. Let's uh, open the water texture section. I'll just solo the water texture layer here. Uh, you can change the direction and speed of the waves. If wave direction is at zero or pointing up like this, the waves will move away from the camera. The wave angle, I think I only used this when I made the beach scene um, because you want the waves to be parallel to the shoreline. Uh, you can rotate them a bit like this. Don't go too far. And maybe you can see the horizon line is a little slanted now because we rotated the entire layer. Um, I'll adjust the wave direction now so that the waves move perpendicular to their angle. And I'll increase the wave speed and maybe stretch those waves out to make them longer. And let's preview that. So I, I did that so that we could see this problem and it seems to happen whenever I rotate the waves. Uh, maybe you can see the flickering. So I've added an effect to the water texture layer called CC Wide Time. So if you ever see that flicker in the water, just turn this effect on and it should smooth everything out. All right, what else? Uh, we have brightness and contrast. If you're familiar with the turbulent noise effect, these will be familiar to you. Uh, you can change the noise type to get different textures. And an important thing to explain about the water, and this involves the texture scale control, um, sometimes I would lower this all the way down to like 5 and 1. So uh, this should look like little dots, right? Like noise. But the texture is still pretty big. Or if I put this back up to like 30 and 5, um, this looks a little pixelated or blocky down here. I don't know if you can see that. You can change the preview resolution to full and it looks a little better, uh, but the texture is still really big. Like what if you want an aerial landscape? So you want the water texture to be really small. Or let me show another uh, illustration of this problem. If you're creating a lake on your ground layer, and your mask comes all the way up here, close to the camera, you'll notice that the edge of the mask is all pixelated or jagged. And it's actually pretty obvious. So all of these are symptoms of the same problem, and that is that the ground plane is scaled way up. 
I'll right click the ground plane and uh, choose reveal and then reveal layer source and project. That will show us a solid layer in the project panel and we can see this layer is 8,500 pixels horizontally and about 2,500 pixels vertically. So 2,500 pixels tall and the layer is pushed back 25,000 pixels. So to reach all the way to the camera, it has to be scaled up an amount of 1,000%. Scaling it up that much lets us use a relatively low resolution layer, which is a lot faster, while also letting us extend the ground all the way back to 25,000 pixels, giving us a lot of room on the ground. Um, scaling it doesn't affect the resolution of our ground being projected onto this layer, but it does show up in the mask edges um, when it's close to the camera or in the water texture because remember the water texture is linked to the ground layer. It's the same resolution, same position, and same scale. Uh, so to fix this we have a couple options. You could increase the resolution of this solid layer in the solid settings panel and uh, then scale the layer way down so that it, it just extends to the camera. And then you would have to also change the resolution in the water texture pre-comp of this solid layer here so that it matches the ground plane. That should work. Um, I never did it that way. I was worried about speed of having a, a huge layer like that. So what I did in some of the landscapes was just bring the ground plane closer, like from 25,000 pixels to about 8,000 pixels back. And then I could scale the layer down to about 330%. So that will change the water texture layer as well. And then we just need to move our projected ground image down just a tiny bit so that the horizon line of the image lines up with the edge of our ground plane. So select this layer and hit the P key and I'll make sure the camera is in its default position. So I'll hit the reset button on the camera. And remember, this is the layer that's just sitting a few pixels in front of the camera, so we don't need to move it much. I'll increase the Y position one pixel at a time to move the layer down, so a value of about seven. So that's about right. So that should solve the resolution problem. Uh, if you want to do a combination of increasing the layer's resolution and scaling it down, that's fine. Um, and we've got this gap now, so we'd have to either move these elements forward now or down. And be sure to scale down the ground plane before you draw your water masks, uh, because the masks that you drew before will no longer fit. All right, finishing up these water controls, um, let's look at these water edge controls real quick. These control effects that are on the ground projection screen layer. So they show up on the edge of your masks. These roughing controls affect the shifting edges of the water, and the stroke controls are for the darkened edges around the mask. Uh, these are pretty straightforward, I think. Moving on to the sky controls, uh, you can adjust the scale of the sky layer. If you want to change its position, you can just do that on the layer directly down here. You can increase the opacity of the stars layer, which I never use this. Uh, because if I wanted a night scene, I would just use auto sky and the stars come out automatically. Um, the sky skew control is cool. You can skew the layer from its anchor point on the horizon line. So this is a way to make your 2D cloud image look more 3D. Extend sky edges. It's just like the ground layer. It tiles the image without having to scale the layer up uh, in case you ever see the edges of the sky. And one final note about the sky down here. If you want, you can rotate this layer toward the camera like this, and it exaggerates the perspective, uh, kind of like having an extreme wide angle lens. So it's, it's just a different look. I'll move on to the sun controls now. Um, it says here, some controls only work when auto sky is turned off. So if something isn't working, uh, that may be why. Um, anyway, let me go over how the sun works. There are several sun layers. Um, down here we have two 3D null layers and they're locked because you don't need to mess with them. This first one sits in the middle of the scene 
And the second one is way out, like 50,000 pixels away from the middle. The second one is parented to the first one. So as this one rotates in place, the second one orbits the entire scene. And right above those layers, we have two 2D layers uh, with a bunch of 2D effects on them that make up the sun. 2D effects can't really orbit around a 3D scene, but they can be linked uh, to this null layers position so that it follows the null, uh, not around the scene, but from about here to here. Um, I only use the null layers to get the timing and speed of the orbit right. Uh, the orbit is linked to the clock control, but uh, we haven't gotten that far yet. Anyway, this layer has most of the sun effects. And this layer is what changes the color of the sky at sunset. And up here we have another layer that adds effects that show up over your entire scene. Like a big glow and a lens flare and light rays. These should be seen over your elements. And these effects disappear behind your elements as the sun sets. So let's look at the controls. Uh, with these three angle controls you can control the position and orbital path of the sun. You can keyframe them if you want to animate the sun, uh, but I would recommend doing that with AutoSky. Uh, the horizon contact point is important for sunsets, especially if you're animating a sunset with AutoSky. Um, this point is where the sun will dim and disappear as it goes down. So you can just click this little crosshair button and then click on the point in your scene where the sun makes contact with the land. The sun is made up of lots of different effects or components, and uh, you can get a lot of different looks with the controls. You can turn off any component using these checkboxes in each section. Toward the bottom, the sky glow and horizon glow, these affect the color of the sky. Both of those effects are on this sun layer that says sky glow. And this layer's blending mode is set to pin light but I recommend you experiment with different blending modes so you can see the different looks. Depending on your cloud image, pin light might not be the best one. The horizon glow is not visible by default. You have to move it up into view. Uh, you can see uh, with the sun controls selected, we can see these two crosshairs in the bottom corners. And the horizon glow is just a beam effect. And right now it's going from here to here but we can move it up using these position controls or we can just drag the crosshairs. Uh, this just creates a gradient in the sky for sunsets. And this is actually all automatic if you have auto sky switched on. Okay, the moon controls. You can have the moon come out in the daytime, uh, but I've darkened our scene with auto sky just so that we can see the moon better. The moon works in a similar way to the sun. Uh, we have two null layers which control the orbit. And you can customize the orbit with the angle controls here. Um, you can change the fullness of the moon and the phase angle. Um, so you can have a, a full moon or a crescent moon. If you have a crescent moon with stars, you may want to add the moon shadow effect uh, from the effects folder. Alright, last of all we have auto sky. Um, I was really happy with how this turned out. I wasn't sure how well it would work when I was creating it, uh, but I ended up using it a lot more and more as I created more landscapes. What it does is it creates automatic color correction on your scene for different times of day, and it makes the sun, moon, and stars all come out automatically. So you can get quick and easy sunsets or night scenes or early morning, and it's also how you can create time-lapse animations so um, you switch it on here with this first checkbox and then there's another checkbox here to put the sun and moon in manual mode and that will stop the sun and moon from orbiting automatically and it will let you have total control over them using the sun controls and moon controls. But even when this is off and the sun and moon are in automatic mode, you can still customize their look and their orbit path uh, using the controls. Next we have the clock control. And think of this just like an ordinary analog clock. One full revolution is 12 hours, and a full day would be two revolutions. It starts at noon, so zero degrees is midday. And if I turn on auto sky at noon, uh, the scene doesn't change that dramatically. Uh, the colors are a little warmer. If I open the day settings, we can adjust the daytime colors. 
AutoSky uses a combination of the tritone effect and a brightness and contrast effect on each element. And I know there are better effects for advanced color correction, but I like these because they're simple and uh, you can tint the highlights, mid-tones, and shadows independently. I am not a color correction guy. Let me just get that out there. I'm actually pitifully colorblind. Before I did After Effects, I was an artist, and the comment I would hear a lot was, interesting colors. So yeah, that, that's why I have these controls in here, so you can adjust them yourself uh, for any time of day. So as you turn the clock to nighttime, uh, you would then use the night settings to control the colors. If it's in between, uh, for example, daytime and sunset, like maybe late afternoon, then you might need to adjust both the day and sunset settings. Uh, because it transitions smoothly between them. Of course, you could always add an adjustment layer over the whole scene and then add your own color correction if you want. Um, but it would affect all the layers underneath it and it would just it would work a little differently. I'm going to go back to nighttime and bring our stars out. If you look down here, uh, the stars are composited over your sky image with the soft light blending mode. Um, you're welcome to try other blending modes or put your clouds above your stars and use a blending mode with the clouds layer. Um, you can move your stars around to see a different part or scale them down if you want. I'll solo the stars layer now and then slowly turn the clock. And you can see uh, it rotates them from their anchor point here. There are no controls for the stars rotation. So if you want a different rotation, you can change the anchor point and position directly on the, this layer. Um, let's talk about time lapses. Uh, you create a time lapse by keyframing the clock control, and then most of the effects will speed up according to how fast the clock is turning. I recommend for time lapses that you choose one of the clear sky images in the sky precomp, so an image without clouds, and then copy and paste one of the clouds layers from the clouds effect into your scene, and those will move in fast motion. Now, if you've keyframed your clock and you like the speed at which your sun or moon is traveling, uh, but you don't like how fast your fog is moving or the water or the wind, I put these controls at the bottom for you so you can easily adjust their speed. These values are a percentage, so at 100%, the clouds are traveling the correct amount according to your clock speed. Um, but you can easily reduce it here, or you can reduce their speed using the cloud controls on the, the clouds layer. There's one more control here, uh, the sun-moon degree of separation control. This changes the timing of their orbit. So I think what I did here is 180 degrees uh, would be 12 hours apart. If you wanted the moon to follow right after the sun, you would decrease this to something like 30 degrees. All right, uh, that's it for the control layer. Um, we're about one third through the tutorial, so we're doing pretty good. Uh, not really, I'm kidding. We're almost done. Um, I thought I would just end with some practical tips on how to improve your landscapes, and then I'll turn you loose to start creating your own landscape. I wanted to mention this thing called parallax uh, because it's kind of our goal when making our landscapes. Parallax is when different elements or parts of your scene are moving faster than other parts as the camera moves. Um, so it creates a sense of depth. In the real world, the amount of parallax is infinite, uh, but in our landscapes, which are made up of 2D images, the amount of parallax is limited. Um, the ground has a lot of it. The front moves faster than the back. Uh, it's less noticeable in the elements. So what I would recommend is just go nuts and add as many elements as you can, spacing them out along the z-axis uh, to add more parallax. The more parallax you have, the better your scene will look. Sometimes you can angle your elements a little by rotating them, and uh, that creates more parallax. And something I recommend, uh, when you add something like a bush, grass, or tree, it's a good practice to double them up and have a duplicate copy right behind the original. Uh, maybe a hundred pixels behind it. So with this bush, I might duplicate it and move one copy back, uh, maybe rotate it or scale it a little to make it look a little different, 
Um, maybe add a mask to the front copy to make it look a little different. Um, so now our bush has a little depth to it, which we can see when the camera moves, or even if it's really subtle, um, that'll help trick our eyes into thinking that the scene is three-dimensional. Sometimes it helps to see the scene from other angles. Um, I might switch to a side view to see how elements are spread out. Um, make sure that no elements are right on top of each other because that's not uh, doing us any parallax favors. So try and spread them out a bit. And sometimes you'll need to uh, duplicate an element a bunch of times to fill up a space with multiple copies. What you can do is adjust the transform properties of each copy to make them all different. Um, so you can move them, rotate them, scale or stretch them, and most importantly, flip them by unlinking the scale values and uh, entering a negative value. You can also draw a mask uh, to mask out certain areas, like the areas that really stand out so that we don't notice them. Um, you can also add a hue saturation effect uh, to these to add variation to each one's brightness and hue. You can bring in your own image to use in your landscape, uh, but you'll need to follow a couple steps or your image will look all messed up. First, you copy the haze and the auto sky effects from some other element to your new element. Make sure the layer has 3D enabled, then copy the material options from another element by expanding the layer, selecting material options, and then copy and paste it to your new element. Many elements have a completely flat or straight base. Um, this was intentional because you can't put an element with a really tall base uh, on the ground plane because as the camera moves, parts of that base aren't going to stick to the ground. As I created more elements, I started rounding out the bases a little more because it, it looks more natural. Um, but if you do encounter one of these images where the base or the bottom of the element is just too flat and straight and it's distracting, you can just round it out with a quick mask. It can be really tempting to always try and fit the whole element in your scene, uh, but keep in mind that these are high resolution images, so you can scale them up quite a bit and just use the parts of the image that you need. And if you want to get an idea of how much you can scale an element before you start losing detail, uh, you can look up the image's resolution by right-clicking the layer, choose Reveal, and then Reveal Layer Source in Project. And then you can see the resolution of the image. Uh, most of them are at least big enough to fill up your whole HD comp. There will be times uh, when you put an element on the ground plane and it just doesn't look like it belongs there. Like it's not part of the scene and it's just floating there. And oftentimes you can fix that with a shadow. A quick way to do that is to just add a drop shadow effect and make the shadow fall downward and then soften it a bit. Or a better looking way is to draw a shadow on the ground plane with a mask. So you select the ground projection screen layer and draw a mask around the base of your element. And then we'll darken that area inside the mask with a hue saturation effect. So you add a hue saturation to the ground layer and turn down the lightness property. And then in the timeline, expand the effect and expand the compositing options click the plus sign, and then set the mask reference to mask one, or whatever mask you just created, and that will darken just that area. For more tips, uh, you can read the notes inside each of those finished landscape comps. Also, don't forget to watch the second tutorial on the effects folder. And that's it for this tutorial. Uh, happy landscaping, and also I'd love to see what you create with this, so feel free to send me a message on Facebook or email me through the site. And if you like the template, please leave a review on the site. That helps me a lot. Um, if you like After Effects and you like this template, there are a whole lot more at creationeffects.com. I've been making these things for a long time. Uh, the most recent is Creation Trippy Effects. 
It's full of psychedelic animations as well as trippy effects for your footage. Uh, there are a number of animal templates which would go well with this landscaper template uh, because you could add animals to your scene. I have elephants, lions, horses, wolves, and panda bears. And as I mentioned earlier, there's the Critter Collection series, which includes flocks for making custom flocks of birds, swarms for custom swarms of insects, and schools for animating fish. There's also falling leaves and auroras. Uh, Ocean is a template with a different way to create realistic 3D bodies of water in After Effects. There's Infinite Horizon for creating perspective bending scenes. Micro, which lets you create uh, realistic microscopic animations. Pixel Pusher lets you make abstract particle animations. Wisp allows you to make custom 3D trails of particles. There's Network for animating networks of lines and dots. There's a typewriter effect, a 3D flag effect, ink bleeds. The custom 3D storybook is probably the all-time most popular. There are old film effects, old VHS effects, digital glitch effects, title effects, and another crowd favorite, creation artifacts, which allows you to convert your footage into animated artwork in just about any medium. <laughs> 